Hello all, Dr. Jeanette Eiswinner here with a lecture on the High Italian Renaissance. When we're discussing the High Italian Renaissance, we're going from about 1495 until 1520. So from um, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper and the expulsion of the de' Medici in Florence that we talked about in our last lecture until the deaths of Leonardo and Raphael. As you can see here, we'll talk about Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael, aka three of the four Ninja Turtles. We talked about Donatello as an early Italian Renaissance artist. The Italian Renaissance is really defined by wanting to have a rebirth of classical art and culture, so we're going to see that, as well as lots of portraiture and using art and using commissions in order to formulate this identity within this new society but also showing um, through those portraits that you are scholarly and learned and erudite. So let's start with looking at a Leonardo so we can start um, talking about some of these formal characteristics of the high Italian Renaissance. And I want to draw your attention to first the space and the depth that Leonardo is showing us in this oil painting. So he's showing us a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. So he's really showing us this illusion of space, this illusion of depth that goes much further into the background. He's showing us that through shading, through modeling, and through his color choices, his co variations in color and his light. And you can see the light source is coming from this top left, coming down onto um, the baby Jesus down here. And then the Virgin Mary in the center gives us this nice triangular composition. And that's going to be one of our other characteristics of the high Italian Renaissance is this very stable triangular composition, normally in the center of that picture plane. I did mention this is an oil painting. Oil painting becomes popular in the late 1400s, so the late 15th century. And oil painting starts in the north and then comes down to the south. Oil painting gives um, this nice, very clear um, characteristic to the image. Um, so previously they were using tempera, which is made with egg whites. So when you think about looking through an egg white, you think about this kind of milky, hazy quality to it. As opposed to you think about looking through a bottle of oil, it's much clearer than um, egg white. So we can see that um, with oils, you build up these thick, you build up these thin layers of paint, these translucent layers of paint, in order to give you um, that nice translucent clear characteristics to these paintings. We also have an idealization of the figure that happens in the High Italian Renaissance. Um, a lot of times with Leonardo, his figures are very pretty. They're very soft, they're very gentle, they're almost angelic. We can really see that again right here with the Virgin Mary. She is very young and just very um, angelic again. And his, um, one of his ideas is that he's showing you that these are spiritual figures through what they're doing, the way that they're composed, the way that they're showing their emotions, and not through any sort of symbolism. There's no giant halo or nimbus to show us these are holy figures. There's no gold background to show us this is a heavenly space. In fact, quite the opposite. This is a very kind of earthy space. Um, you can almost smell kind of the mold and the damp, dark aspects to this painting. Um, and yet these are holy figures and we meant to understand them as such through the light source, through the way they're interacting with one another, through the way that they look. So we're really showing the mind through the body with none of that symbolism for Leonardo. Probably our most, um, one of the most well-known Leonardo da Vinci paintings is The Last Supper. One of the first things you'll notice about The Last Supper is that it's in very poor condition. Um, he was experimenting with techniques of fresco painting. So fresco is when you paint onto wet plaster. Um, so that's a true fresco. So Leonardo was experimenting with that technique and unfortunately the fresco painting started to actually flake off of the wall during his own lifetime. So some scholars have suggested that only 20% um, of this painting is original and that the rest of it is actually uh, reconstructions. So take it with a little bit of grain of salt. But what we're seeing here is that Last Supper, 
you have Jesus in the center. Notice that his body creates this pyramid with his arms coming out to either side. And he is pointing to the bread and he's pointing to his wine. So you do have this allusion to the Eucharist, to the body and the blood of Christ. Again, we don't have anything to tell us that this is Jesus. We don't have a big nimbus or halo or anything like that to say this is a holy figure. But Leonardo is giving us that doorway behind Jesus Christ in order to illuminate that figure. So it does draw our attention directly to that central figure. And then the same thing with these orthogonals with the linear perspective that we see in this room. Um, and there is a short artifact on linear perspective if you want to refresh your memory. So all of those are bringing our eye to the central figure, telling us that this figure of Jesus is the most important. One of the unusual things about this Last Supper is that Judas is on the same side of the table as the rest of the apostles. In a lot of earlier depictions of the Last Supper, we see Judas separated and placed on the side of the table closest to the viewer so that he um, really stands out. You know who the antagonist is in that narrative. Here we're seeing Judas on the same side of the table, but he is kind of cloaked in shadow. And we're seeing the moment right after Jesus says, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me, right? And all of these figures, all of the apostles are looking at one another saying, is it me? Is it me? Who is it? What's going on? Um, is it me? And you can see that kind of turmoil. So the figures on the outside have less emotional reaction than these figures on the inside are starting to get really, um, really angry and very animated. And then you really have Jesus in the center kind of staking the entire composition. As you'll see, Judas is the only one with his hand on the table. So one of the next things that Jesus says in the book of Luke is, but yet behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. You'll notice every other apostle has their hands in the air. They're gesturing, again, showing their body, showing their mind through their body, as opposed to Judas. So that's the other way that we know Judas is from that verse. The light source for this painting is actually the light source in the room where this is painted. So this is still in situ. It's still in the place where it was originally painted. And that place is a refectory, so um, kind of a dining hall up near um, the city of Milan in Italy. So you can see that he's using the light source from the windows on the wall and incorporating that into the painting, which gives it even more of this naturalistic quality. Again, a Leonardo da Vinci painting, um, one of the last ones we'll talk about, is again one of the most important, one of the most well-known. Don't hate me, I think one of the most boring. We just, um, it's had a rough life, right? <laughs> so the varnish had made it very yellow. She gets this kind of um, yellowish pallor to her skin because of the way that the varnish has aged. She originally had two columns, one on either side of the central figure. Again, we see that pyramidal composition, this kind of angelic face. Um, but if you look very close, you'll see that she's sitting on a porch called a loggia. And on that porch, there are columns. And you can see the bases of the columns on either side, so kind of flanking her. So this um, painting had been cut. So there would have been columns on either side, framing the figure. And then just the landscape, look at that landscape. It's so weird, right? It's this strange kind of dystopian, otherworldly landscape. Um, I, there are ideas about it. So you'll notice that the ground, the horizon lines, I mean, in the background, they don't line up. This road that you can see on her one side doesn't really continue on the other side. The same thing with this aqueduct over here doesn't really make sense if it, because it doesn't continue onto the other side of the figure. So um, kind of this um, tension in the background always bothers me, and I haven't heard this, the best explanation for why that is yet. There are, of course, a million different theories for what he's expressing in that background. 
Um, we think that this woman is um, Lisa Di Antonio Maria Gerardini, which is why we call her Mona Lisa, so My Lady Lisa. And then um, we see her with her hands, but you'll notice we don't see her with any sort of um, like symbols of wealth, symbols of status. She does not have eyebrows, so we know she's upper class because upper class women would shave their eyebrows and make your forehead look bigger. It implies more um, intelligence. So that was pretty common in the early 16th century. But she doesn't have lots of jewels. Um, we can look at a painting from the late 15th century, so from the early Italian Renaissance, and you'll see the Mona Lisa is just so different. She doesn't have any of these jewels. She doesn't have any of this um, makeup that we see in the other painting. And she's a three quarter view, right? So she is not a profile view. Instead, she's turned her body, she's looking at the viewer, and really Leonardo popularizes this three quarter view for a portraiture. Portraiture in and of itself is a very Renaissance idea, right? Recording how you look for posterity because you as an individual are important. And this comes back to the idea of humanism so that um, there, every person has individual human potential. And this was something that really defines the Renaissance and is an idea coming from the Greeks, from the ancient Greeks. Another woman who um, has her portrait painted over and over again is Isabella de Este. She is the Marchioness of Mantua. And she is an avid art collector. She's an avid art patron. And we're seeing in scholarship more and more focus on who were the people commissioning the art, especially women, especially um, people that have kind of been written out of history before. So you can see that on the left, we have a Leonardo um, sketch for a portrait of Isabella de Este. And that, again, we would have seen her hands, no real symbols of wealth. Again, that's not really Leonardo's thing. And then she would have been profile view, so turned to the side. And, um, you know, that pyramidal composition, finally. So very Leonardo it would have probably been a very beautiful painting um, in his style. And he, we don't have a lot of his paintings left. So that's why I'm also showing you the Titian on the other side. We think of Leonardo as a painter, but we also think of Leonardo as um, a scholar, really, and an academic, and somebody who really wants to understand the processes and the way that nature works and how, how much knowledge can you have? How much knowledge can you know about this natural world? And he is one of the first to use cutaway views. He's um, sometimes said that these cutaway views that he makes are foundational for modern textbooks, for sciences and for anatomy, that this idea originates with Leonardo. So you're seeing here on um, the fetus, the lining of the uterus. So a lot of these also he learned through dissection, which was a crime, it was a sin um, to desecrate the human body in that way. But he felt that it was necessary in order to gain this knowledge. And we do have even um, paintings from Leonardo where he would go back in and repaint musculature. He would repaint the body as he kept developing his understanding of the body. So remember that one of these characteristics of the high renaissance is erudition and learning and education and that individual human potential that you are reaching through that education. So Leonardo is primarily working up in the north. Um, he's really popular in Milan for a while. I'm going to move us down to the south, down to Rome, where we will spend the majority of our time. So Raphael is another one of our high Renaissance artists, which I'm sure you know from the Ninja Turtles. We can talk about the same painting styles, the same compositional styles here with this Raphael, as we talked about with Leonardo. So you have that pyramidal composition. You have naturalism and idealization of the figures. And also, like we said, foreground, middle ground, background, so that illusion of space, that atmospheric perspective, and then um, this understanding of the body, right? 
Jesus looks like a baby. He's acting like a baby. You get this idea. He's kind of unsteady on his feet. Um, and then you can see the Virgin's hands coming down, helping him kind of toddle along. So really we get this idea of this naturalism and of this um, family grouping that we have. So we have the Virgin Mary, um, again, in her pyramidal composition. We have Jesus right here. Notice he um, is foreshadowing his crucifixion by holding onto that staff that John the Baptist has that he's holding down here. Remember, they are cousins. So Raphael um, was trained in Umbria by Perugino, and he famously moves um, to Rome where he's influenced by another artist named Bramante. And while in Rome, he really becomes a painter to the popes. And that's um, most of what we know for Raphael is that he painted a lot for the papacy. And this is one of the image that he painted for the papacy. This is in the papal apartments in the Vatican specifically in the papal library where the Pope is going to sign all of their official documents. So he was asked to paint the, um, so there are four frescoes, I think a four walled room, four frescoes, and they show the four branches of human knowledge and wisdom. So again, being a good humanist, being a good person at this time, you have to be educated. And the same thing goes for the Pope. To be a good Pope, you have to have a knowledge of theology, law, sometimes called justice, poetry, and philosophy. And then Raphael took these ideas and kind of manifest them in these um, human forms. And he places the frescoes with theology and philosophy facing one another. And then obviously law and poetry facing one another. So this kind of balancing of those different ideas and those different discourses. We're seeing here, um, his idea of these great philosophers, these great scientists of the ancient world all gathered together, right? This is like the biggest, most boring probably dinner party in the world. Um, you have Plato over here pointing to the heavens saying, this is where my inspiration comes from. You have Aristotle on the other side pointing to the earth saying, this is where my inspiration comes from. And then all philosophers who are influenced by Plato are on his side. Those influenced by Aristotle are over on his side. We can again talk about these characteristics of the high Italian Renaissance. Specifically, we have great linear perspective here. We have that illusion of depth. We have um, pyramidal compositions and Raphael gives us those through the groupings of figures, so through those figures themselves. But then also, he gets tricky, right? He does it through the negative space at the front. So you can see Heraclitus over here, the figure over here, whose name I'm forgetting. They create these diagonals coming down, almost this kind of welcoming space as you're coming into the room, moving up those stairs towards these figures. That creates the stability of that pyramidal composition is actually the negative space. Um, I always remember this is Heraclitus because supposedly it's a portrait of Michelangelo and Michelangelo as kind of this tortured individualistic um, soul. So he's down there. And then Raphael paints his self-portrait right over here. He's wearing a little black cap, peeking out um, at the viewer and staring directly at them. So you can always find Raphael over there. And unfortunately, Raphael did die relatively young, um, kind of at the height of his game, we can say. Like I said, he was one to paint for the papacy. And here we have him painting for Leo X. Leo X was a de Medici. So if you remember the de Medici from the early Italian Renaissance. And he was the second son of Lorenzo the Magnificent. He was um, awful. He was best known for wasteful habits, lechery, hedonism. 
um, his kind of wastefulness and his attitude towards people and money directly leads to the Protestant Reformation, which we'll get to in another lecture. But notice the date on this is 1517. October 31st, 1517 is when Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral and starts that cleft in the Catholic Church that eventually ends up creating Protestantism. So just kind of know there's a lot of political turmoil at the time. Um, Rome is kind of a gross place to be at this time. So um, a lot of that comes back to kind of this mismanaging of the papacy and of the papacy funds through popes like Leo X and his nephew who eventually becomes um, Clement the Seventh on his side. And then this is his cousin behind him who eventually becomes a cardinal. But what I really wanted to show you here is just how detailed Raphael gets in his paintings. So you have to imagine this painting is really big first off, so he's got a lot of room to work with. But because he's using oil paintings, because he's doing glazing, he's creating these very um, light layers, these translucent layers of oil painting, he's able to keep building up those layers and getting more and more and more detail to each and every one of those layers. So if we zoom all the way in, we'd be able to even read the text in the Bible that Pope Leo X is reading. So much so that scholars have gone in and identified this as the Hamilton Bible that was owned by Pope Leo X's father, Lorenzo Magnificent, Lorenzo de' Medici. Um, you can see the artwork in the Bible is also very, very detailed. Um, I really love the texture of the fur on his cloak. And we see the bell as well as the symbol of power. I mean, at first you're like, why is a bell a symbol of power? Because it was used to summon his servants. So comes the symbol of the power that he holds um, in order to summon people. So, one other thing um, about Pope Leo X is that the de' Medici in general were um, collectors of what we call Americana. So the other thing happening at this time, there's so much going on in the early 1500s, is you have the colonization of the Americas. So you have Columbus sailing in 1492, um, but you have 1521 as the defeat of the Aztecs in what is today Mexico, um, 1532, the defeat of the Inca and what is today Peru, and the sending back of lots of luxury items. So both um, gold, jade, an incredible amount of these luxury items coming back to Europe, but also flora and fauna. And we're seeing that here, and that is maize, that is corn, right? So think about the things that Europe didn't have before the colonization of the Americas. Things like corn, things like tomatoes, turkeys, right? All of these are indigenous to the Americas. Potatoes, squash, none of those existed in Europe prior to the early 1500s. And when they did start coming over, they became very popular. They were very exotic um, as symbols of wealth, symbols of status, and symbols of being educated. So most of the, actually none of the de' Medici ever went to the Americas, but they were big collectors of objects coming from the Americas. So again, to show how kind of worldly and educated they are. So one of the um, final things we should talk about before we get to Michelangelo is that Leonardo writes a treatise called Treatise on Painting. And it essentially says painting's the best, sculpture is just manual labor, which he thought was a bad thing. So Michelangelo, on the other hand, says painting's boring, you're just copying. When I sculpt, I make man. When I sculpt, I have this, um, it's similar to divine power, right? He would never say he has it because that's um, not okay by the church, but he is releasing this image. He's releasing this artwork that is trapped in the stone is how Michelangelo talks about his artworks. So you do have these two different discourses, these two different ideas running throughout Renaissance art and um, discourse. So I'll start with one of his earliest sculptures and this being the Pieta 
It was originally commissioned as a tomb sculpture. Now um, that didn't end up happening, but it does end up in Vatican City, so in the Vatican in Rome. And he was 23 when he signed the contract for this work. Um, so a lot of times when we talk about Michelangelo, we talk about him as this genius, right? That he's just kind of brimming with all of these ideas and he just can't help to be so magnificent. Um, he definitely thought that about himself sometimes too. So much so when there was all of this buzz about this sculpture and people were like, who could have created this? This is magnificent. Um, he gets frustrated because he kept saying, it's me. And they were like, no, it's not. You're too young. So he actually goes back in and carves his name on the strap across the Virgin's breast. And it's the only artwork that he has signed. Um, because he does it in this fit of kind of ego and hubris. So characteristics of the high Italian Renaissance. So we can see here that pyramidal composition, of course. And you'll notice that the Virgin's body is huge. We saw this also with um, Raphael's Madonna in the Meadow, that the Virgin becomes the symbol for the foundation of the church because she constantly has Christ on her lap, either Christ as a child Christ is a grown man, she becomes the foundation for the church. So we can see that here she is this throne, she is this foundation, she is this solid rock upon which Christ can rest. So the Pietà is traditionally after Christ has been removed from the cross and he is being held by the Virgin and she is kind of weeping over him. Um, Michelangelo also does study human anatomy, he studies dissection, but it doesn't really um, rule his artwork and like it does some other artists. We can see that naturalism. Um, I always see it right here where the Virgin's figures really push up that flesh of the armpit. It looks like flesh. This illusionism of turning that marble into that flesh by making it pliant, by making it look like um, these fingers are acting on it, right? And Christ's head as coming back, you really get this idea of the weight of the body, the weight of the head. And then the Virgin Mary, um, another characteristic of the high Renaissance, just so pretty, <laughs> so angelic, right? She looks young, she looks beautiful. Probably wouldn't be the case when your son is that old. So Michelangelo starts in Florence, is where he begins his career. But if you remember, the de' Medici are run out in 1494, and that's when Michelangelo leaves Florence. He does come back for a pretty good commission, um, so he creates another David. So there are really three main images of David I like to talk about. We have Donatello's in the early Italian Renaissance. We have Michelangelo's that you're seeing here for the high Italian Renaissance. And then we'll look at another one for the Baroque. Um, so when we're looking at Michelangelo's, we're seeing the moment before the battle with Goliath. If you remember for Donatello, Donatello, we were looking at the moment after. You can see Goliath's head down here. But with Michelangelo, we're seeing that moment before. And he's getting this from Greek sculpture. And the Greeks want to show you the pregnant moment before something happens. So this is that pause. This is him taking um, stock of his opponent. He's leaning slightly back on that leg. His other leg is bent. And this is a um, posture that we call contrapposto, that again is really coming from the classical Greeks. He's twisting his head to the side, so that gaze is going towards Goliath, slingshot in one hand draped over his shoulder, and then the stone he's kind of um, rolling through his fingers of his other hand. So we have this tension of the body, we have all of his muscles tensed up. His face is very um, stoic, very focused as well. And then he um, is kind of turning away from the viewer. You'll notice also coming from, um, this is from the Romans, this tree trunk in the background is something that the Romans would use when they were copying Greek bronzes and making them in marble they would put that tree trunk in to support the figure because the medium was so much heavier. The marble was so much heavier than the original bronze. 
Um, one thing when you go to see this in person, you'll notice he has ridiculously big hands. <laughs> and the thing is, this was commissioned to be put onto the Duomo, so to be put onto a building up high. So we weren't really meant to see it like this. And again, when you go see it in Florence, you'll notice it's really high up on this pedestal. And that's so we can get that original feeling, that original viewpoint um, that Michelangelo intended because he did alter the proportions of the figure in order to accommodate the position of the viewer. So last but not least, I wanted to talk about, of course, the Sistine Chapel, <laughs> all right? We've probably all heard of this. Um, the Sistine Chapel is important for the Catholic Church because this is where the College of Cardinals gathers in order to elect a new Pope. So it um, was already painted by the time Michelangelo gets here. So the wall paintings are prior to Michelangelo. He paints the ceiling and he paints the back wall, and we'll finish with that back wall. So I wanna show you the ceiling. It is 5,800 square feet, 70 feet tall, and he paints over 300 figures. And the focus really here is meant to be Genesis and the beginning of the Old Testament. But if you look, the nine scenes from Genesis are really small compared to the rest of the ceiling. So you have these nine scenes, but then you also have these naked figures holding everything up. You have these ignudi figures is what we call them. And they really represent this unrestrained ascension of the soul towards heaven. They're very graceful, but also Michelangelo is not a painter, right? Michelangelo is a sculptor. And when you are a sculptor, you are He's sculpting bodies. He's interested in the human body. So he's doing what he does best. He's just now making those figures in a different medium. Um, Michelangelo is described as an isolated, proud, independent, and temperamental artist, um, which we've kind of covered before, but I just love this quote. He's writing this um, He's writing this letter and he talks about, I've grown a goiter from this torture, my stomach squashed under my chin, my beard's pointing at heaven, my brain's crushed in a casket, my breast twists like a harpy's, my brush above me all the time dribbles paint so my face makes a fine floor for droppings. And he's talking about this experience of standing on scaffolding 70 feet in the air and trying to paint above him. And he didn't do cartoons for this. He didn't make preparatory sketches. He kind of goes in and tackles it all at once. So um, you can see this little figure he drew of himself painting. You can just imagine the paint dripping down on his face as well. So just um, Michelangelo being Michelangelo, being temperamental and cranky. Probably our best known scene from the Sistine Chapel is our creation of Adam. And this is really kind of the height of the high Renaissance. And we kind of use this to define that the Renaissance. But again, Michelangelo isn't a painter. So when you're looking at his figures, you can really see that they're sculptural. He's really sculpting them out of light and shadow when you're looking at these figures. And this moment um, wasn't really depicted prior to this image, um, at least not in the way of Adam being kind of fully formed. And he's talking about this moment in Genesis that says, the Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Another thing that we wouldn't have seen in some prior um, time periods is this depiction of God. And this idea of God as this old wise man, right? That would have been heretical. That would have been revolutionary in former time periods. Could have been kicked out of the church for it. But here we have it very, very prominently because of humanism, because of this belief in individual human potential. You can see, again, the pregnant moment before something happens is what Michelangelo is showing us. And I say that because their fingers are just not touching, right? You have the little teeny, teeny, tiny bit, 
in between the figures of the two fingers, the fingers of the two figures, and we're seeing um, that Adam is not quite alive yet. So that pregnant moment before, we know what's going to happen. You can see Adam on this diagonal and his body as a counter to God's body, right? So they fit together like puzzle pieces. They mirror one another. This large drapery cloak, whatever you want to call it, around God has received some scholarly attention. Um, some scholars argue it's kind of a womb that kind of comes down. Um, and again, Michelangelo might know about wombs from his dissections. So that's one idea. Um, the other figures that have received some recent attention are the figure underneath God's arm. One idea is um, is that this is Eve. So she's waiting for Adam to be created and she'll be created a little bit later. The other idea is that this is the Virgin Mary. If it's the Virgin Mary, then um, scholars have argued that this figure is the Christ child. And that's why God's finger is so prominently like kind of pushing down on that child. So it would be the Virgin Mary and then Christ next to him. And it kind of creates this nice line, this very linear movement from Adam through God to Christ, who's going to redeem the sins of Adam. The other figure um, scholars have looked at recently is the one holding up God. And some have argued that that's Lucifer, so this fallen angel, who we now talk about as kind of the devil. But what we can really get from the Sistine Chapel ceiling is that Michelangelo is really rejecting traditional iconography. He's rejecting traditional ways that these figures have been represented. And it's kind of a breath of fresh air in terms of the ways that he's depicting the figures as these sculptural forms out of light and shadow, but also um, the way that he's showing them within these new configurations. One of the other things about the Sistine Chapel ceiling is that it got very dirty. <laughs> so for hundreds of years, they were in this, um, Sistine Chapel is very small, in this very small space, burning incense, burning candles, and all of that soot, all of that grime, all of that dirt sticks to the, your ceiling. And that's what happened. So until 1977, the scholarship talks about the Sistine Chapel ceiling as being very dark and as interpreting that um, as Michelangelo's intent. From 1977 until 1989, they went in and they cleaned the ceiling. Very tediously, sponges, very lightly, just cleaning the ceiling, getting all of that grime off. Um, there's a video on YouTube that you can look up about it. Um, it's so satisfying because it reveals these beautiful, bright colors. And scholarship had to be reevaluated to then accommodate for Michelangelo's intent to be things like these bright oranges, these bright, vivid greens, these light pinks for the body. And we see all of that musculature as well, right? Look at her back. It's overly muscular as Michelangelo is, again, sculpting with light and shadow. So um, it was very controversial at the time. They thought that something um, original had been removed. And again, art historical scholarship was just turned on its head by what this restoration revealed. So the last image I want to talk to you about today um, technically falls outside of the High Renaissance. So after about 1520, we move into a style called mannerism. Mannerism, um, saying the mannerist style is kind of redundant because mannerism comes from the term maniera, which means style. And it's talking about style as being sophistication, elegance, poise. And it's kind of a rejection of everything we've been talking about. It's a rejection of this very strict observation of the natural world being reproduced in two dimensions. So it plays around with space and time and perspective. And some scholars look at um, Michelangelo's Last Judgment as one of the first Mannerist paintings. And that is because when we look at these figures, they are now too muscular, right? They are almost a character, like a caricature of a muscular figure. 
he knows better. He's done dissections. We can see these muscular figures in the ceiling. And yet on that back wall, in that last judgment, there are just too many muscles. So is this a rejection of what he was doing before? Is this a rejection of that close observation of that natural world? Or is this him really wanting to sculpt, really wanting to play with light and shadow? The other thing that we see with this figure is, or with this um, painting is it's very um, tumultuous, right? There's lots of energy and it's not good energy. There's lots of writhing and twisting and um, you can see the figures coming out of the ground, right? This is the last judgment. So this is the second coming of Christ. He is here to judge everyone. And when that happens, um, Christians, technically, according to the Bible, Christians will come out of the ground to dance, to be, to go to heaven. Um, so we have these kind of haunting figures being pulled out of the ground. You have the figures um, on the damned side. So the side to Christ's right, these figures are going to heaven. The side on his left, they're going to hell. You can see this figure swinging this paddle to get these figures out of his boat and into the depths of hell. You have Christ in the center who, um, again, overly muscular, way too big, heads way too small, turning his body like he's going to strike down any figure on that other side to protect his mother who is kind of cowering next to him. So again, it's a very big kind of violent scene that we see here. Um, and some scholars have proposed that it's a reference to the Protestant Reformation. We're about 20 years after Martin Luther. We are in the heart of really a culture war in Europe between the Catholics and the Protestants. And a very violent war is happening, both in terms of the um, destruction of art, the destruction of property, but also the um, intolerance of faith of some individuals. Um, the best example being a Catholic priest killed at the altar by a Protestant kind of assassin. So it's a very tumultuous time within the church. And we see that reflected in Michelangelo's painting here. Um, I will also draw your attention to supposedly Michelangelo's self-portrait. So this is a image of St. Bartholomew and he was skinned alive. So St. Bartholomew is being shown um, holding his own skin and supposedly that face is a self-portrait of Michelangelo which can just again give you an idea of how he felt about this very tumultuous time and his place within um, the church at this time. So thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you again.